and welcome to the YouTube channel for craftworldeldar.com. I'm Brent, and we are back in the library, which is where we started with these videos a few months ago. And we're in the library because in this video, I'm not demonstrating anything. Uh, I'm not going to move models around. I'm going to be talking to you about the ninth edition Craftworlds Codex. I'm going to make some predictions about changes that we can expect to see in that book, how that will affect the meta, uh, and maybe you, how you want to think about collecting and modeling between now and then. Uh, to be clear, I don't have any insider information. I don't have an uncle who works at Games Workshop. I'm not a playtester. for. The, if I were a playtester for the new codex, obviously I wouldn't be making this video. Uh, these, But nevertheless, these this isn't just my total random speculation. The, the conjecture that I am going to put forward is based on what we've seen in the Drakari Codex and other sort of broad faction changes and changes to the game that have been developing with each codex that's come out in ninth edition such that there are certain alterations that will happen to the craft world's rules that we we, we know are we know what's going to happen we know what's coming uh there are many ways in which i'm sure they will change that we i i certainly can't predict but this particular video has been the most requested piece of content since summer started which surprises me. Uh, nevertheless, it's true. And, and so lots of people asked for this. Th this is what I'm doing. I I'll start with the changes that are, th they're coming, right? Um, with 99% certainty, we can say certain things will happen. And then in, in the latter part of the video, I'll talk a little bit more about changes that are a little bit more hypothetical. There's still basis for them. If you're interested in just what I would like to see, like, Brent, if you worked for Games Workshop, how would you? I did a blog post about that uh, a, a few months ago. And and that one is, I think, as I said in the beginning of the post, sometimes when I'm in the shower, I think about how I would change the codex or what rules I would write or when I'm driving. I bet many of you do the same thing. And so that's a self-indulgent post about, you know, what I would do. But this is not that. This is uh, how to predict and plan for what probably is coming, and then uh, other other changes that we you know we might anticipate. So, I'll dive in. Uh, oh, before I dive in, I will say I had really hoped. So I, I've been I've been putting this video off because GW announced that they were releasing the Codex roadmap for the rest of 2021, which implied that they were going to tell us what the rest of the codexes would be for 2021 and today. They announced that they would announce what codexes were coming out in November and December at some point in the future. We already knew there would be codexes in November and December. So all we really learned today is that one of those codexes will be an Imperial Codex in December and one of those codexes will be a Xenos Codex. So maybe in December we'll see Craft Worlds. I'm certainly hoping for that. Uh, no guarantees. Curiously, if, if you get on the Eldar Facebook page, the Eldari Facebook page, there's a whole bunch of salt about how it's obviously not going to be Craft World, it's going to be Tyranids. But then if you get on the Tyranids Facebook page, there's a whole bunch of salt about how it's obviously not going to be Tyranids, it's going to be Gene Steeler Cult. And if you get on the Gene Steeler Cult page, they say, well, it's obvious, and so on. Uh, everybody, everybody's mad. To be honest, I'm a little mad too. I was, I was, I was hoping we were going to hear we were getting our codex. But, uh, Short of that, when we do get our codex, maybe in December, here are some changes that you can expect. So we'll start with the stuff that's all but certain. Uh, I think the, the changes we can be most confident of are changes to heavy weapons profiles. So if, if you haven't already gotten the memo that the Bright Lance is definitely going from D6 damage to D3 plus 3, I'm here to tell you that that's what's happening. Uh, the the Equivalent Drakari weapon, the Dark Lance, is now D3 plus 3. The equivalent Imperial weapon, the Laz Cannon, is now D3 plus 3. It's just definitely happening. We will have a heavy weapon that does D3 plus 3. How is this going to change the meta for Eldar? Well, uh, for Craft World specifically, suddenly War Walkers. War Walkers are already great in 9th edition. They're the, the least, the most points efficient way to bring significant volume of fire to the table, and currently they have they have an invuln safe, which I think they're going to keep. I, I don't know that, but I think they will. I'll talk about why later. Uh, fabulous. So now that we have a weapon, we you can on a Warwalker, you can have two, theoretically at 80 points, you'll have two weapons, both doing D3 plus 3. 
uh, an, on a unit of three war walkers with six of these things, that's an absolute nightmare. Not only is it some of the most efficient uh, monster and tank elimination available to us, but think about how this is going to function against bikes or against three wound heavy infantry. It will be absolutely brutal against factions like Death Guard, right, that rely on uh, resilient units that it's minus one to damage them, right? Disgusting resilience changed. That's huge because D3 plus three means you, you're guaranteed to auto kill, even in a Death Guard list, any three wound unit uh, if you hit it. Whereas previously with the D6 damage, uh, that was not the case. So Warwalkers, which are already good, will get a lot better. Um, let's see what, oh, the 80 points. I said, I think Warwalkers will, will remain at 80 points. The reason I say this is if you look at the uh, Admech Chicken Walkers, which are essentially an equivalent unit, but they don't have the five up invuln. They are 75 points with the same loadout. And so I think that uh, the War Walkers will stay right about where they are in cost and they'll just be a super efficient chassis for these much better weapons. Now, anytime something gets better, other stuff by comparison gets worse. It could be the case that we, we, unless star cannons get some sort of bonus or, or a point drop, uh, you might see the Bright Lance putting a little bit of pressure on the star cannon. Suddenly D3 damage doesn't look quite as desirable when for five more points. So maybe, maybe there will be something will happen to the star cannon. That one I'm much less certain about. I, it could go to D3 plus one flat that goes to flat. I don't think it'll go to flat two for reasons I will get to. Uh, but it could be the case that the Star Cannon gets worse because the Bright Lance has gotten better. So that's a change you might expect to see to the meta. Next change to heavy weapons that I think we can be totally confident about. And this this one's big. Uh, Shuriken Cannons are going to go to flat 2 damage. You heard it here first. It's Everybody knows this who's been following the releases. And and the reason that I say everybody knows this is that, the, the again, the equivalent Drakari weapon, the Splinter Cannon, that went to flat two. The equivalent Imperial weapon, the Heavy Bolter, that went to flat two. So one of the changes that we're seeing to the Ninth Ed meta in general is that everything does its job more reliably and, and more specifically. Every, every unit in the army has, and, and every faction, right, has a pretty clear job that it needs to do. And it's, it's doing that job uh, in a way that is just more statistically reliable. And I, in part, I think GW is trying to create, uh, I don't know, there's talk of like televising competitive play. I don't know if that would work or not in the same way that esports are, are starting to become a thing. Well, they have become a thing. There's banter about whether or not something could happen like that with tabletop war games. And in order for that to make sense, strategies have to be a little bit more reliable and with a little bit less dice de dependent, which I, I like. I think that's cool. I think it's good for the game. Uh, so everything's doing its job a little bit more reliably. And so the, the new slot for weapons like the Heavy Bolter and the Splinter Cannon and now the Shuriken Cannon will be eliminating heavy infantry. So you'll have stuff like the Scatter Laser for light infantry, and then you'll have these flat two damage weapons for use against heavy infantry. That's fabulous, right? Again, the Shuriken Cannon will therefore also be putting pressure on the Star Cannon because the Star Cannon used to be the most efficient way to eliminate two wound models. And now that's less obviously true. It will still be true for units with excellent armor saves, presuming that Shuriken Cannons don't also get some sort of better AP. But even if they got minus one, at minus three, the Star Cannon still goes through armor more, more effectively. Uh, and, and I don't, I don't know if we'll see a change to the, the Shuriken Cannon's AP, but we will see a change to its damage profile, and that will definitely make it a better pick against some targets. In terms of what this will mean for your collection or for the meta, suddenly Wind Riders might be more relevant, again, as target elimination units rather than just board control units. I'll talk more about Wind Riders later. I think, I, I think they're going to get a big boost, uh, for reasons, but a unit of six or even nine wind riders will suddenly become the most points efficient way to bring a bunch of these flat two damage shuriken cannons to the table and they may they may have a real role to play uh obviously your war walkers also if, if you have not magnetized them or if you're buying war walkers and you're deciding should i if, if there's one unit in your army that you should magnetize it's the war walker uh you need like a dremel or a tiny drill to drill out little 
two little slots next to one another for two magnets in the War Walker and two in the weapon so that they don't swivel. Uh, there is a guide on my website, I think, for magnetizing, which is pretty easy to, pretty easy to follow. Uh, having the option to switch out the weapons, because again, I think in certain metas, the shuriken cannons, depending on what job you want your War Walkers to do, might really suddenly be the pick. And that just in eighth, man, shuriken cannons were not were not good. So it's it's nice to see a weapon that was essentially only used in narrative play uh, really have some have a reason to exist in a competitive list. Cheap wave serpents, right? The, the cheapest wave serpent with the default uh, shuriken cannons, suddenly the cheap wave serpent is better. So some of us have been, at least in some games, swapping star cannons onto our wave serpent. So it's no longer clear whether or not that's something you you will want to do or or need to do. Okay. So that's the heavy weapons changes I think that we can be sure about. There are, there's one other one that I'll get to in the latter part of this video that I think we can suspect is probably coming. Uh, but another change that I think is all but cer certain is that Guardians will go to a 4 plus save. Calibites, the Drakari, the closest thing uh, Drakari have to a Guardian, went to a 4 plus save. And given the job Guardians do on the table, it, it, it just makes sense, right? I, I think that I, I, with 85% confidence, I can say that Guardians are going to a 4 plus armor save. What does that mean for the Guardian on the table? Well, uh, on its own, that's probably not enough to fix the issue that we have with Guardians at the moment, which is that they, in order for the Guardians to be a, a unit that's worth including, you have to make good use of Celestial Shield. Celestial Shield is the stratagem that gives them a four up invuln only against shooting attacks. But because the Shuriken Catapult has a 12 inch range, the only way to use Guardians Guardian defenders is is to put them in deep strike, teleport them in nine inches from an enemy unit, and then light it up with your shuriken catapults. But now you're guaranteed to be within easy melee range of your opponent, and so celestial shield is just it's it's very easy to work around that. Uh, it's it, I I think it's actually better used on minimum units of storm guardians in your own deployment zone, holding an objective. If you cast protect on them now, they have a three up invuln against shooting. Uh, but it's, it's been really hard to use defenders. So we may see the shuriken catapult also get a range increase. I think this is very likely actually. If the shuriken catapult gets a range increase and guardians get a four up save, guardians are now dire avengers, almost. Uh, so now dire avengers need some sort of benefit because Dire Avengers and Guardians have always sort of jostled for the same troop slot. So you need that unit to be distinct from Guardians in an important way, and having an additional one leadership is definitely not enough. So when we see the Exarch powers reworked, which I, th I think we will, those Exarch powers that we saw in Phoenix Rising will be replaced either with a new set of options that in include some of those, or the other possibility is that there are just built-in Exarch powers that are that are better, uh, or or the best of those Phoenix Rising powers. I hope this doesn't happen. I, I like the flexibility of being able to pick an Exarch power, and, and they may they may go with that, but guaranteed the Exarch powers will be revised, and so that will have to be the thing, right, that distinguishes Dire Avengers, unless the Dire Avenger catapult gets some, because currently they're different weapons, right? Uh, the, the Guardians have a Guardian Defender Catapult, and the Shuriken Catapult carried by the Dire Avengers is a is a different weapon with a, a slightly six-inch greater range. Uh, the profile may get some other distinction. I suspect not, though. I, I suspect what they'll do is they'll make the, the, the differentiation with the Exarch power. So Guardians are going to get better. Uh, they'll be more durable, and they may they may get better weapons. And that might mean that all those Dire Avengers that you bought for 9th edition, because they're currently the best troops option, suddenly do have some competition. So it's it's something to something to consider. Another change, speaking of Dire Avengers, that I think is absolutely we can be absolutely confident about, but it's much more vague than these others that I've mentioned. Aspect Warriors are going to get a lot better. They will. Uh, I don't know exactly how, but it is probably the, the single change that the craft worlds community has clamored for most. 
And in and of itself, that isn't enough to, reason to think that GW is going to do it. But combined with the fact that what we've seen in ninth edition is that every faction has gotten much, much better at doing the thing that Hang on. I might be right back. I am right back. Excuse me. A more professional Brent would edit that out, but that seems like a lot of work. My uh, camera control started blinking and I thought perhaps my battery had died. Any hoozy. Uh, I was saying, every faction has been altered uh, that has a new codex. Every faction that has a new codex, right? Uh, units have very specific jobs that they do pretty well, pretty reliably. That's kind of like the angle in, in ninth edition is that it's supposed to be more tactical and less dice-based. And, and what aspect warriors are is units that do a very specific job very well. And so what we've seen with these other codexes that have come out is units getting buffed and, and slotted into very specific roles. So, you know, Drakari witches are much better at being melee killers and tar pits than they used to be. They still can get shot off the table like nothing, but uh, but in melee, they're great. Incubi, same deal, right? Um, and I think that's what we're going to see with Aspect Warriors. So uh, your Dark Reapers will continue to be good. Your Shining Spears will continue to be good. All those other Aspect Warriors that really suffered in 8th edition are going to get a big overhaul. Uh, we've seen Swooping Hawks and Warp Spiders have already been better in ninth because they can perform secondaries. Warp Spiders are probably the single best unit for scoring secondary points because they can help you score engage on all fronts. And they're also good for two hard to reach quadrants for Retrieve Octarius data. It, in terms of points for points, that is army building points for victory points, they're probably the most efficient unit in the army. But, uh, Ideally, if you look at the lore for warp spiders, they're killers, right? And so it would be nice if they if they could also do that. I I don't know, um, but but I think that they will. All of those aspect warrior units are going to get some love to help them do their thing better. I think swooping hawk grenade packs will no longer stink. I don't know exactly how they're going to fix them. It could simply be that they're no longer limited to. They can drop a number of grenades equal to whatever's lower, either the number of hawks in the squad or the number of units in the target as it is now, I suspect that it will go to something like the number of hawks in the squad. Or if you're specifically using it against vehicles, like with Admech, maybe it's this many dice total. Um, but something will happen to make those grenade packs better and swooping hawks will still be a good utility unit. Fire dragons, I have a whole blog post and a whole video about fire dragons and why they're a bit better because now they can fire and fade into vehicles. Uh, it's possible that their weapons will get a little bit better. That happened with the equivalent Space Marine unit. They got crazy long range. Uh, I think we're going to see some sort of improvement to the, the fire dragon fusion gun. Banshees and scorpions, I think we'll get an extra attack. I think it's almost inevitable that scorpions will get forward deployment. It's not what I want to happen to scorp I In my blog post about what I would do if I worked at Games Workshop, I have this whole shtick about how I would fix scorpions with a stratagem. Uh, nevertheless, I think that the simpler, the simpler fix and the one that GW is almost certainly going to go for is to make them a, a forward deployment unit. So the way, just in case you don't know, the way that works is uh, you, you deploy them in the deployment phase as you would any other unit, but instead of being limited to your own deployment zone, they can deploy anywhere on the table as long as they are nine inches from enemy units and nine inches from your enemy's deployment zone. So if you get first turn, in theory, you could put 20 scorpions on the table and be all over your opponent's back line with those turn one guaranteed if you get first turn. So in that sense, it's a bit of a risky play. Uh, Admac have a bunch of units that do this. Space Marines have units that do this. Mandrakes, Drakari Mandrakes do this. And so I think that Scorpions are just going to be the Craft World's version of this unit. I, I Hopefully, the, uh, the revamp we see to the Exarch powers and that extra attack and, and maybe a new weapons profile will also make them a little bit more efficient in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because the, the Scorpions have two problems right now. One is that they can't kill anything. 
and the other one is that they can't reach anything, even if they, they could kill things. So I, I suspect that both of those will be addressed. And one of the ways that that might be addressed, maybe, is that exercs will be allowed to take certain relics. Again, this is something that we've seen in other codexes. So in the Drukhari Codex, the succubus, there are certain relics that the succubus can take, uh, which makes your witches much more powerful. Um, not succubus, succubus is the HQ, whatever the squad leader is for witches. Uh, I think that we will see something equivalent, and so that will be yet another way. You could make a unit of scorpions super effective, is to take some relic weapon, give it to the Exarch, and hopefully be in your opponent's back line turn one. Banshees also need some love. They will get some new Exarch power or utility power. I would love to see the ability to strip Obsec uh, with, as, with the Banshee Scream. Shutting down Overwatch just isn't that great in an addition in which it's, it's now a stratagem, so your op opponent can only do it once anyway. Uh, it, it's still situationally useful, but it's, just, it's, not, it's not a good enough power. So um, I think all the Aspect Warriors will get better. Being able to take those relics will be big, uh, but I think that whatever job each of them does, they will do much more efficiently because that's just what we've been seeing in ninth edition. Phoenix Lords. Phoenix Lords are going to get better too. If you want to know what your Phoenix Lords will be like, look at uh, Drezar, the Drakari Phoenix Lord. It, spoiler alert. Although GW has not said this explicitly, they have all but said explicitly that Drezar, who is the essentially Drukhari Incubi founder, is in fact the original striking scorpion Phoenix Lord who sort of left the path and gave in to his desires and has become this ascetic murder monk who never speaks and treat, treat, uh, trains Drakari to be honorable ascetic murder monks. He's fabulous on the table. He's so good, he's terrifying, super efficient for his points. He does his job really well. I, I really think the majority of our Phoenix Lords are going to look a lot like that. The, the Currently, we do have rules for the Shadow Spectre Phoenix Lord. I'm terrified to mispronounce his name. Every, I People always point out when there are pronunciation issues. So. Uh, the Shadow Spectre Phoenix Lord, pretty good, right? And is one of the only Phoenix Lords other than Asserman that ever sees play in competitive lists. I I don't use him. I would rather just have a squad of Shadow Spectres for the same uh, cost. But I, I some of the stuff in the Imperial Armor book is frankly feels a little bit unfinished anyway. And, and I think that he goes... So I don't think the fact that he is just pretty good is necessarily an indication of what the Phoenix Lords and the Codex will be like. I mean, Shadow Spectre, the Shadow Spectre Exarch has no Exarch power and no weapon loadout different from the Spectres in his, unlike every other Exarch in the game, uh, he just doesn't have any special weapons or special rules, which suggests to me that they just didn't really finish the, the Shadow Spectres. And so I, I'm not really worried about the Shadow Spectre Phoenix Lord as a indicator of what the the Codex Phoenix Lords will be like, for for that reason. Other let's see other things that we can be all but certain of. Ah, expert crafters, expert crafters, haters. You guys are going to get your day in the sun and gals, and them's, because expert crafters is almost certainly not going to survive uh, the arrival of the Codex. And in almost every way, the Codex is going to make craft worlds be better, and overall, it will definitely make them better. There are, there are certain advantages that exist now that will go away, and one of them is, I think, that whatever Expert Crafters becomes will just be a toned-down version of it. Either it'll go away completely, I don't think so, or it will be replaced with, you reroll a wound die or a to-hit die. You, you don't get to reroll both, and you may not get to do it both in the shooting phase and in the fight phase. Uh, it's, ob it's obviously a bit overpowered, it's, it's only not overpowered because craft worlds are so behind in the power curve right now with uh, factions that have codexes. But in terms of an individual faction ability, sub-faction ability, when you also get to choose another one, it is disproportionately better than almost everything in the game. And I, it feels like a bone that GW threw craft worlds players to just help us keep our heads above water until we have that new codex. But you, 
don't it's it's going right so uh don't don't get attached on the flip side another change that i think we can be sure of is that the uh, Subfaction bonuses for the mainstream craft worlds, the core craft worlds, will get so much better. At least in most of the codexes that have come out, the, the majority of subfactions in the codex are totally playable in, in competitive 40k. There's usually one that isn't. Uh, there's often one or two that are obviously the best, but everything is definitely good enough to make the grade for competitive play most of it is good enough to make the grade for competitive play so right now the meta is for craft worlds if you're a competitive player almost invariably you're running a custom craft world list because everything that the the mainstream craft worlds do there's some combination of custom craft world bonuses currently that's like better than that thing or at least is good and then you get something else and that's going to change uh in in the new codexes the custom stuff tends actually to be a little bit underpowered one of the exceptions to that was dark technomancers for drakari which then they just nerfed the crap out of it looks like maybe they just didn't notice that there was this certain combo that you could create with weapons that auto hit uh and and that that was around for not long at all and it got faq'd so those of us who have been hitting the custom craft world bonuses hard i think we're going to see the competitive meta shift back towards mainstream craft worlds i don't know which ones are going to be good uh but I'm just in my my gut. I think Ulthway will be good. Bell Ten will be good, and Samhain will do its thing really well. Uh, there are reasons that I think this. I will not go down that rabbit hole right now. I also could be totally wrong. It, that that one really is just conjecture. But I think custom craft worlds are going to probably take a backseat to to mainstream craft worlds because that's what's been true in every one of the codexes that's come out for Ninth Edition so far. Let's see. Oh, Wind Riders. I said earlier that I was going to talk about Wind Riders. Uh, Wind Riders are going to get better. I think their stat line won't change. I think that they're... So the, the comparison for them, Drakari Reavers, right? They For 20 points, you can get a Drakari Reaver. For 20 points, you can get a Wind Rider. And then when you compare the stat lines, they're reasonably similar. The, the Reavers are better in melee. Cool. But then Reavers also have special abilities and stratagems that allow them to do super cool things. And Wind Riders don't. They're just, they just don't. So I think what we'll see is probably one super cool special ability for Wind Riders and then one stratagem uh, or, or two that lets them do something really good. I suspect what it will be because several armies have units that do this is that if the unit is within six or nine inches of the edge of the board you remove the unit and you can bring it on uh like a reinforcement unit on the following turn that increase to their mobility will be fabulous right so i again i think wind riders are going to go from being uh very difficult to use effectively to having some real play and you can use wind riders uh strip down units of wind riders on turn one for for blocking opponents movement and scoring engage on all fronts just that minimum 60 point unit is is pretty good it you you, you can do it uh it, but it's not nearly as efficient as what other factions have and so i think wind riders are going to get some real love uh last change that is definitely coming autarchs will buff fewer units currently autarchs buff everything commander units like autarchs in ninth edition only buff core units we don't know what units will and won't have core but some of them won't have core. So currently you can use your Autark to buff everything, let it reroll ones to hit. Uh, when we get our ninth edition codex, they won't be true anymore. Maybe the Autark will get something else uh, to help balance out that. Okay, here are some changes that are merely possible, things that might happen. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Brent, how can you wear a hat that cool and expect me to focus on what it is you're saying. I mean, you've already got such a great beard and now you're wearing that hat. I mean, and I say to you, imaginary future video viewer, I know it's hard. It's hard to be a Craft Worlds player, but we, we soldier on, it's what we do. Uh, the first change that is merely probable is that the D cannon, which currently does D6 damage, I think will go to D6 plus two. Uh, the, the corollary to this would be the Drukari, the Drukari Heat Lance, which does D6 plus two. 
it, and the reason I think this is that if bright lances are going to D3 plus 3, and they are, and a D cannon fires D3 shots, it might go to two shots. The, the, the sort of unreliable rate of fire is another thing in 9th edition that they're, they're stripping out a bit. Uh, but regardless of whether or not it goes to two or stays at D3, I think there's a definite chance that we'll see D6 plus two because otherwise it compares so unfavorably to the Bright Lance. So currently the D cannon is 40 points and it's only 24 inches. Uh, and it's it's similar to the Bright Lance, except the rate of fire, it's it's closer range, the rate of fire is uncertain. You can get two Bright Lances for 40, but th they all do D6 damage right now. And and so in order to keep that parity, I, I don't think it'll go to D3 plus 3, it might, uh, but it needs some sort of damage boost. Otherwise, it is an indirect fire weapon, which is huge. And I think that it would therefore still be playable but it would compare so unfavorably in its damage profile to the Bright Lance if it lost, if it didn't get some kind of bump, that I suspect that they will bump it. Uh, again, conjecture, but that, but we, that's what we've seen in other codexes, is that weapons that sort of are, are in some way similar to that Laz Cannon, Dark Lance, whatever it is, uh, have gone to D6 plus 2, mostly. Okay, what else? Let's see, forward deploy, I mentioned that. Ah, psychic powers. So psychic powers are definitely going to get overhauled. Some of them, there, most of the names, I think we'll say, there's, there will always be a jinx, there will always be a doom. This stuff has been around for a long time. Exactly how it works may change a bit. I suspect doom probably won't change a great deal. Uh, I don't know if we will continue to have runes of fortune. We might not. I hope we do. I like them. But another thing that's happening in ninth is... Uh, certain aspects of the game are actually getting a little bit simpler and having three different lists of psychic powers is it's kind of a lot um we might lose runes of fortune again i hope not i like being able to switch out smite especially while warlocks only have baby smite but i, I wouldn't count on it sticking around the bigger change to psychic powers that i think we might see and here i am this really is conjecture i think it's possible that warlocks will no longer cast psychic powers in a conventional way. Instead, what might happen is you roll a d6, and on a 3-up it just works. It, it is not subject to deny the witch. Or maybe if we're really lucky, on a 2-up it just works. It's not subject to deny the witch. And the reason that I suspect this might happen is that there's precedent. So Sisters of Battle uh, work like this. Space Marine Chaplains work like this. And there was a, an earlier edition of 40k in which Warlock powers just worked. Not only did you, not that you didn't even roll at all. Not only could they not be denied, but they just auto worked. And so, in order to again strip down the number of lists you're choosing psychic powers from and speed up the game with less rolling, uh, I think we might see this change. This could be excellent for us, especially if those powers go off. Imagine if, if you're getting off Jinx on a, or, or or Protect on a two up, and it's not deniable, or there's, or it's three up, and there's some stratagem or subfaction bonus that gets you to a two up with it. That could be super strong. The other way in which this could just be great for us is if warlocks retain the psyker keyword and can continue to deny, because ah, this would mean a warlock could use protect, which would then not be a psychic power, and then attempt a psychic secondary. One of the big reasons not to take the psychic secondaries at the moment, which should be great for Eldar, right? Eld in theory, Craft World Eldar are one of the most powerful psyker factions in the game. But in order to attempt a psychic secondary, that psyker cannot cast a psychic power. And that's a big sacrifice for an army that hugely relies on its psychic synergies. So in the event that warlocks sort of auto-activate their runes powers, uh, and can still do this, suddenly those psychic power or psychic secondaries may have a lot more play, a lot more utility for us. Uh, again, conjecture, but there is precedent for it, both in the history of Eldar as a faction and also in the other codexes that we've seen in ninth edition so far. So maybe. Uh, more vehicles are gonna have a five up invuln save, I think, I'm pretty sure, probably. Uh, two reasons I think this is true. One, 
again, they're trying to make things do their jobs a little bit more reliably and Eldar vehicles are just too fragile right now. And more importantly, in Imperial armor, every single Eldar tank, except for the Warp Hunter, which has indirect fire, so it, you know, it stays out of line of sight, every single one of them has a five up invuln. Currently, the only one people are running is the Lynx and that is a five up invuln, that's great. So we may see, uh, I don't know exactly what's going to get it and what won't, but we may see a bunch of Eldar tanks get a five up invuln, I would guess, just off the top of my head, Falcons probably would get it. Maybe Night Spinners won't because they're kind of like the Warp Hunter with the indirect fire. Maybe Fire Prisms will, I don't know, but uh, tanks may get a bit better. Uh, some closing notes. I, I think even when we get a new codex, the flyers are going to continue to struggle. And I wish that weren't true. I bought a bunch of them back at the beginning of 8th when they were good. But uh, the board got smaller in 8th edition or 9th edition. And so the extra mobility provided by flyers is not as valuable as it used to be. And the problem is that the way GW has done this is flyers and tanks cost about the same, but then flyers give up uh, some durability and maybe some killiness uh, in exchange for their mobility. Currently, getting into line of sight to hit a target is not a big problem for craft worlds. So that like Crimson Hunter model, you are paying compared to say uh, a Falcon or a Fire Prism or whatever, you're paying additional points for mobility that you maybe don't need, right? Um, I think we're probably going to want the durability because those those tanks because they're they're our tanks already fly and they're already pretty fast. So I don't think the Flyers are going to bring enough extra uh, to really have play. The exception, the Hemlock, may get a rules rewrite that gives it some play on certain lists. What I think will happen to the Hemlock is that it will be more obviously equivalent to a bomber model. So most factions that have a couple of Flyers have some sort of dedicated bomber, right? Uh, Admac has one, Drakari have one, and you can run this up the up the table first turn. It can deal a bunch of mortal wounds. The Hemlock sort of does this right now with Smite, but uh, most of these other bombers have a higher mortal wound output with no opportunity to deny than Smite does. So I could see them changing the rules for the Hemlock to, to sort of like that Warlock thing where yes, it's kind of a psychic thing, but you roll a D6 and on a three up this happens. I think we might see something like that with the Hemlock and it may do its bombing that way. Uh, and depending on how many points it costs, it's possible that as a first turn mortal wound sort of trading unit, maybe the Hemlock will have some play. Uh, but I'm not holding my breath on, on the Flyers. The good news is the Flyers are the only units in the, in the Eldar line at the moment that I think don't necessarily stand to benefit uh, from a new codex. We're going to love the new. It's going to be great. Uh, here's the other thing about the new codex. We've all been playing Craft Worlds with, without a new codex since the beginning of 9th edition. And if, if you can currently win any games at all with your Craft Worlds armies against armies that have a 9th edition codex, well, my friend, when you have a 9th edition codex of your own, you will be an absolute monster. So... Uh, I, I was hoping to be able to say at the beginning of this video that GW just announced the Codex roadmap and it's coming in December. And instead, what we're saying is there will be a Xenos Codex in December and it could be Craft Worlds. Uh, but if it isn't, it within the next few months, we're going to see it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a huge step up. Uh, I'm super excited about it. And... The, in those those matchups that you're playing right now that are a bit frustrating, it's very hard to play Admech right now, set yourself reasonable goals and think of it as training, right? You're, you're playing the game on hard uh, so that when, when it becomes fair again and you have a codex of your own, you are going to be a tactical genius. That's the hope. All right, that's what I've got. Fellow Autarchs, Farseers, Exarchs, and creepy spooky guys who hang around the craft world eating mushrooms and making predictions.
Uh, I look forward to seeing you in my next video. I'm not sure what it'll be yet. Hopefully it's coming soon. If you have your own ideas about what you expect to see in the 9th edition codex, please leave a comment below. If you like the video, please leave a comment below. If you're interested in my ramblings about the rules I would write, you can head over to craftworldalder.com, go to my blog, scroll down, and find uh, the 9th edition codex that I'm hoping for. I'll see you next time.